you take your Bibles and turn with me, not to the Gospel of Luke, but to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking together this morning at verses 3 through 7 in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For the next several weeks, we're starting a a quick, short series this morning. For the next several weeks, we're going to take a break from our study in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to spend some time focusing on the church. We're going to look at what it is and why we should value it and what is its glory and how should it be structured. We're starting that this morning by looking at our emphasis on discipleship groups. But we're doing that as a kickoff for looking at the church as a whole. The church is something that we need to have a deep understanding of. Not just as a place to come to, but what is it? What does the Bible say about the church? Paul says in Ephesians chapter three that it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And that this is according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when Paul talks about the church, Paul says the church is the way that God is displaying his manifold wisdom to all of the cosmos and that this is his eternal purpose that he brought about in Christ Jesus. So the church is really important. It's a display of God's glory. It's what God intended to do through Christ Jesus for all eternity. So it's really important for us to think about what is the church? And why should we love it? And why is it glorious? And what does it do? When we talk about the church, we're talking about God's wisdom, and we're talking about his eternal purpose, and we're talking about Jesus Christ and how all these things fit together in the church. It's my hope that as we look at the church over these next several weeks, that God would grow our love for it, love for what it is, who we are as a body together. I hope that as we look at this, that we'll see that a church is not just a series of ministries, it's not just a series of services or gatherings or programs, but I hope that we see the church for the glory that it is and what God wants us to see in the church. And that begins today with us focusing on the launch of our discipleship groups. So what I want us to do this morning as we look at this passage is we're gonna look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7, Because this text gives us a foundation for what it is that we're trying to accomplish in our discipleship groups. So let's look at it together. 2 Corinthians chapter one, verses three through seven. Paul writes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Father, I ask you to bless this time that we consider these words together this morning. Father, I ask that as I stand here and try to proclaim the sweetness and the glories of Jesus Christ that are in these verses, I pray, Father, that you would attend my words with power and that you would be active in each and every heart. Father, help us 
in this moment to lay aside distractions, help us to lay aside what we have going on later on this afternoon, help us to lay aside anything but what you have to say to us in these words. Father, make our hearts know the sweetness of what we see here and help that sweetness to shape the way that we live. We ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. The main point of what Paul is trying to get across here in these verses, I, th I think is relatively clear. Paul is saying to us in these verses that when God's people suffer, they suffer affliction, that he sends comfort to them. And he sends them that comfort with the intention of they would then go, having received that comfort, and comfort other believers. So these verses are talking about how God as a good father cares for his children, gives comfort to them, but also how he helps the family together comfort each other. Let's point out some specific things that help us know that this is what he's saying. First thing I want us to see is that these verses tell us that God will always, this is key for us to remember, I hope you know this this morning, God will always comfort his children, always. God will never leave any of his children without some kind of means as his com uh, without some kind of means of receiving his comfort. Look at what he says in verse three and four. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, all comfort. And then verse four, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So it seems pretty clear to me that he's saying, no matter what kind of affliction or suffering you're going through, God has comfort for you in that. God is a good father and he will not leave you without some kind of comfort. It will come to you. We can know that certainly. He comforts us in our affliction so we can have unshaken hope that we'll never have to go through anything without receiving some kind of comfort from God. The second thing about God's comfort here is that Paul says here that God is going to send his comfort while we are in the midst of that hardship. It always comes to us while we're suffering through it. In verse four, the expression that Paul uses that's translated who comforts us in all our afflictions means who comforts us during. That's what the word in there means. It means during our affliction. So Paul had the conviction that if suffering came into my life or in, if any affliction came into my life, if I am experiencing any difficulty, he says, I know that the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort is going to come and he will bring his comfort to me in the midst of that difficulty. That is going to happen. He was confident in it and he wants the Corinthians and us today to know that, that no affliction will pass us by, that God will not come to us while it is happening and bring us comfort if we know where to look. And third, it's clear that God provides us with this comfort for a particular purpose. So yes, he does want us to be comforted as a good father should. He wants us to be comforted, but he comforts us for a purpose Verse four, so that, he comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may then be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So God comforts us, yes, to comfort us, but also so that we are now equipped to minister to and serve each other, so that we can now be a source and a means of comfort to people who are going through any affliction. He says that in verse four with the so that, then he says it again in verse six. He says, if we are afflicted, he says, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, then it is for your comfort. So he says, if we're afflicted, 
If we go through any kind of suffering, we have a confidence, we're sure, that God is going to come to us in that. He's going to bring us comfort, and then now we're going to be able to comfort you. And when that comfort comes, then we're able to pass that along. Affliction in the life of a believer is God's way of preparing them to be a source of comfort to another one of his children when they suffer. So that's the main gist of what Paul is saying here. He's saying God is the father of all comfort. He will always comfort his his children. He will bring that comfort in the midst of a difficulty. He'll never let one pass without bringing us his comfort. And he comforts us to equip us to enable us to comfort and help one another. That's why I say these verses are one of the passages of scripture that is behind our idea of D groups. We wanna have discipleship groups so that we as a church can have relationships where we are digging into one another's lives. We're spending time talking about what we're actually dealing with and going through so that through those relationships, we might point each other to the comfort that God wants to bring to us. We can't live this out if all we do is come into large gatherings like this. We're not able to administer comfort to one another in all of the different afflictions that we face if all we ever do is to come in here and yes, gather together and this is good and this is important, but D groups are the way that we're able to have face-to-face interactions. It's where we're able to build particular relationships, people who know us, people who know the struggles that we're facing, people who know what about our life is hard so that we can speak into those things. We can't do that in here. And that's why we have discipleship groups. I think about the discipleship groups that I've been a part of here at Bush and I think about the people that I've been in those groups with and I can look at every single one of those people and know, I know your life. I know what's going on with you. I know what challenges you face. I know the things that are difficult for you. I've prayed with you about those things, both in our meetings and for you throughout the week. That's the idea behind discipleship groups. We want to be able to administer God's comfort to those when they go through any kind of suffering or struggling. That's the whole idea behind it. But what I wanna pay particular attention to this morning is what that comfort looks like. When we look at these verses, it's clear that, okay, God comforts us always during the affliction so that we're able to comfort each other. But the big question that resounded and pounded in my heart this week as I looked at this is, well, what does that comfort look like? Because it's clear that God gives me this comfort and then he now wants to employ me to dish out that comfort to others. So what does it look like? How does God comfort and how can we then use that to comfort other people? I think that's the vital question that we have to answer in these verses. What does God's comfort when we suffer look like? And how can we give that comfort to somebody else? Well, first let's think about what that comfort is not. Because really before I dug into this text this week, I think I had a wrong understanding of what God's comfort looks like. I think before when I would quote this verse, I've quoted this verse so many times to people in counseling sessions and people who are struggling or going through hard times. I've quoted it before and I thought, hey, he's the father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our afflictions. And I think what I thought it meant in those times was that when we go through something hard, God then in some kind of supernatural, mysterious way, he just works comfort into our hearts. We're in some kind of hard situation, we're going through something difficult and God in his own divine supernatural way gives us a sense of peace and a sense of comfort that maybe we can't even understand or explain, we just have it. I think that's what I always thought that this passage meant, but I don't think that's quite right. At least not for what Paul is saying here. 
It may be the case that God does do this. We can think about passages like Philippians 4 where he talks about how the peace of God which surpasses understanding will come and will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So it may be the case that God does supernaturally work that kind of comfort in our lives when we are afflicted, but I don't think that's what Paul means here. And the reason why I don't think that that's the case is because Paul's very clear here that the very comfort that he's talking about that God gives is also a comfort that he wants us to then give out to other people. And you and I don't have the ability to supernaturally, mysteriously, divinely work into somebody else's heart a sense of comfort. If Paul means here that God just gives us a sense of comfort that maybe we can't, it's not tied to anything concrete, he just gives it to us and we can feel it in our hearts, that's not something that we're able to then turn around and do for somebody else. I wish that we could. I wish that I was able to do that. You all are probably like me. You've seen someone that you love suffer and go through something hard and they're struggling and you wish that you could just crawl inside of their chest and Give them some kind of joy and some kind of comfort. You see them just languishing through something hard and difficult and you wish that you could just pray comfort into their hearts. You you try to search for the right thing to say or or the right thing to bring out. You wish that you could just do something and then to realize I can't do that can be frustrating, but I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here because we're not able to do that. The comfort that Paul is talking about here that God gives us, it has to be more concrete and it has to be more specific. It has to be something that he brings into our hearts that we're then able to shine out toward other people. I think the key to understanding what that is is in verse five. I think what Paul is getting at in these verses and how God comforts us and how we're able to comfort other people, we see most clearly in verse five. He says, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. So the comfort that Paul is talking about here is specifically a Christ-shaped comfort. It's a Christ-centered comfort. So what I want to show to you is the two parts of this Christ-centered, Christ-shaped comfort. I want you to see what it is and then how God gives it to us. So first thing about what it is. As we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so also through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And what I think he means by that is, here's what the gospel has shown us about Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, before he entered into his joy and vindication and victory and glory, he first went through suffering. That's the trajectory of the gospel. Suffering first, then glory. Loss, difficulty, affliction first. That's what Christ suffered. And then after that, then his glory. And what Paul means by, as we share in the sufferings of Christ, we also may through Christ be comforted. I think what he's trying to get us to understand is because that's the trajectory of Christ and we're united to him, that's what our life is gonna look like too. We are going to go through difficult, hard, afflicting, suffering things. But for the believer, that is always, 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 always followed by and concluded in victory and glory. That's the trajectory. That was Christ. And because we're united to him, that's us too. That's our story. The story of our life is going to include suffering and difficulty and hardship. But because of Jesus Christ, we also know 
that he endured the cross and then went into joy, we'll do the same thing. And that idea is just all over the Bible. It's all over the place. It's in the Old Testament. I read it this morning in the Psalms. It's in the New Testament. It's all over the place that if we are God's children and we follow his son, Jesus Christ, our life is going to look like suffering, but then always, always glory after. Let me just point you to a few places. The first is from Jesus himself, Mark 8, verses 34 through 35. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there, I don't know if there's any other way to understand that as a call to suffering. I don't know if there's any other way we can explain, take up a cross and come after me as a call to suffer with Jesus Christ. But then Jesus says, for Whoever would save his life, so whoever doesn't want to take up his cross and suffer with Jesus, he will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, in other words, whoever takes up his cross and is willing to suffer with me, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Cross now, salvation later. Suffering now, Glory later. Second passage, Romans 8, 16 to 17. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This is one of the most remarkable passages of scripture in all the Bible to me. We are co-heirs with Christ. Meaning what he inherits by his victory, we inherit. His power, his reign, his rule, his glory, he shares that with us. We're co-heirs with Jesus Christ. But look at what he says next. He says, we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided that we share in the sufferings of Christ. Only if we suffer with him, then we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we're united to Christ, we're children of God, we're his heirs, we're co-heirs with Christ, provided that we follow the trajectory of his life, suffering, then glory. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 12. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure suffering, we will also reign with him. So we die with him, so that we can live with him. We suffer with him, we endure that suffering, so that we can reign with him. This is why the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, after he just got done talking about all the sufferings of people who have had faith in God throughout the years, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He says, you wanna know how to live your life? Look at Jesus and look at his trajectory. Cross, glory. Glory. Death, life. Suffering, victory. That's the trajectory of our life. We share in the sufferings of Christ so that on the other side, we also get his joy. So that's the the Christ-shaped trajectory of our life. Suffering, then glory. Now, how does God then comfort us with that? 
I think the answer to that question is God shines his light into our hearts so that when we hear that, we rejoice. God opens our eyes to help us to see that that trajectory, suffering and then glory, but it's suffering with Christ and glory with Christ. That is a glorious thing worth doing. And the reason why I think that's the case is because of what Paul is gonna say just a few chapters over in 2 Corinthians. So you might not even have to turn the page in your Bible, but in 2 Corinthians chapter four, starting in verse four, I think this is Paul fleshing out what he says back here in 1.5. He says, in their case, and there means those who don't believe the gospel. In their case, in the case of those who do not Believe the gospel. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So he says, unbelievers, they, they, they look at Christ, they look at the trajectory of his life, they don't see glory, they're blinded to it, they can't see it. The God of this world has given spiritual blindness, they cannot see it as glorious. Then verse six Then God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So for them, they see Christ, they see no glory, they're they're blinded. But what God has done is he's shown into our hearts and he says, look at this, this is glorious, suffering then glory. If that's the trajectory of your life, so long as it's united to Christ, because Christ is glorious, that's a life worth living. Yes, there will be suffering. Yes, affliction, but glory at the end because of Jesus. It's all centered on seeing Jesus. He is so glorious, I will be glad to suffer with him if it means I get to share in his glory. Because look at what Paul says a few verses down. Now that God has shown in our hearts, now that we see that the gospel of Christ, the message of his life, suffering, but then glory, defeat, then victory, because we see that as glorious, look at what he says in verse eight. He says, since that's the case, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, meaning confused. We don't know what's going on. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Then listen to what he says. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might also be manifested in our bodies. He says, I will willingly carry around the death and the sufferings of Jesus if it means that I get to share his glory. It's like... You've been walking around your whole life with a blindfold on and you can't see anything and then somebody takes you out to the Grand Canyon at sunrise and rips the blindfold off and you see it. Glory, it fills your heart. You're overwhelmed. Yes, it's beautiful, it's lovely. That's what God has done for us in Christ. He's helped us and shown into our hearts to help us to see that Christ is glorious. And even if it means I have to suffer with him, share in his sufferings, if it means I get his glory, bring me the suffering because I may be pressed down, but I will not be crushed. And I may be persecuted, but I will not be abandoned. If suffering leads to glory and that glory is the glory of Christ, sign me up. Amen. How God comforts us is he points us back to Jesus Christ and helps us to see the glory. Yes, suffering, but glory. And so then what you and I do is we join that voice and we remind one another in the suffering When you suffer, we remind each other, you don't suffer alone. It's not like you were walking and you were good with Christ and then you screwed up, you did something, you messed up and now you're into the suffering. No, if you're with Jesus, you're gonna suffer. You're not suffering by yourself and don't forget that at the end of this suffering is glory. 
Don't forget that when this suffering is over, there is glory afterwards. Look at what he says at the end of chapter four. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We get into D groups to remind one another of that. Yes, life is hard. Yes, life is frustrating. Yes, things are difficult. We should expect that. Christ also suffered. But if we suffer with him, we will share his glory. And God is using the very thing in your life that is so hard and so afflicting to produce for you, to multiply for you an eternal weight of glory. It's not just that, okay, you've got the suffering, get through it, and then there's glory. He says that this suffering that you're going through right now is actually the means by which God is preparing you to have a greater experience of his glory. Y'all, we get into D groups to remind one another of Jesus, to point to the trajectory of his life. We get into D groups so that we have people in our ears as we go through something hard saying, don't forget Jesus. Set your eyes on Jesus. Don't let the pain make you look away. Don't let the difficulty cause you to doubt. Keep looking at him. Look at him, he suffered, and then he went to glory. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Do the same thing. We're right here with you. We're suffering with you. Suffering leads to glory. So brothers and sisters, I wanna leave you with a twofold challenge this morning. Number one, realize what God is doing in your affliction. And don't waste it. Too often we waste the hard times in our life. We complain about it, we try to get out of it. Realize that if God has brought you to suffering, he intends to use it to bring you to glory. So let him shine into your heart. As he points you to Jesus, listen to him. Remember Jesus Christ, who suffered first and then entered his glory. Don't waste your affliction by complaining about it. And by trying so hard to get out from under it when it's clear that God doesn't want you out from under it. And number two, as you look at Jesus yourself, help other people do that too. Sometimes when your life is hard and you're in the middle of it and you're struggling, it's hard for you to turn your heart toward Jesus, but hearing a brother and sister in your ear saying, Dustin, don't give up, keep looking at Jesus. Remember what he's doing. Fix your eyes on him. He had a cross to go through before he got to the glory. Your life's gonna be the same thing. Don't give up. Make sure you're in a group so that you can join your voice to the work of God in the heart to point people toward Jesus. And when we do this, I guarantee this place will be filled with the kind of rejoicing and glory that Paul's talking about here. Filled with comfort in every affliction with the comfort that God gives us. Let's pray. Father, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. God, we're gonna sing again in just a second. We know how the story ends. We will be with you again. We're fighting battles that you've already won. The victory is ours. It was accomplished when Jesus Christ raised from the dead and ascended to your right hand. The victory was assured. You have called us to walk through suffering before we share that glory. So God, help us. Help us this morning to fix our eyes on Jesus. Not to waste our suffering keep our eyes on Jesus, to be a voice in one another's lives, to fix our hearts on Jesus. Help us, Father. Bless us. Do this work in us even as we sing. 
We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.